Chris and Scott and Quarter appreciate that. I failed to recognize a special guest today. All the guests are special, but Mr. Oakley Estes is with us for the first time at church today, so Tyler Jr., proud for y'all. Congratulations. It's, uh, Mr. Oakley's uh, visiting with us today, so we're proud to see another baby. You look around here, we've got a lot of babies. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? That is great to see babies and children. What a blessing. If you hadn't been in a church one that has no children, you just don't know how blessed we are. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Y'all keep it. More and more way to build a church. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Some of y'all got that. <laughs> you got your Bibles with you this morning. Let's go to the Old Testament book of Nehemiah again. Nehemiah chapter 9 is where we'll be this morning as we continue our sermon series through the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 9 is where we'll be taking our text from this morning. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 3. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. Now, you probably... If your memory is pretty good, if you were awake the last time we were here, you're saying, well, and we are talking about ingredients for revival. Well, revival didn't end in chapter 8, praise God. They're going over chapter 9. Revival just keeps going here. As we'll see some more unusual characteristics of uh, things uh, outside of normalcy here in chapter 9. We find this morning in the title of this morning's message is ingredients for revival. And so this morning's ingredient we're going to look at is Repentance is repentance. Now, one Christian dictionary defines repentance as uh, contrition, the acknowledgement and condemnation of one's own sins together with a turning back towards God. That's what the simple definition of repent means, to turn. And it's, it comes from uh, someone repenting of, of their waywardness away from God. You know, Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you that unless you all... Uh, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In 2 Peter 3.9, the Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, in chapter 8, we saw where the people experienced revival, if you remember. They made up their minds. They got together. They asked Ezra the priest to come and bring the law and preach to them. And he preached a six-hour sermon as the people stood and listened to God's Word for six hours. And in that time, we saw that the first ingredient was you must have the preaching of the Word of God. God's Word is vital to revival. Then we saw the second ingredient in chapter 8 was the hearing of the Word. You've got to be present to hear the Word. And when you hear the Word, you are to receive the Word. You're to accept it. And we saw the people accepted it by verbally expressing amen and visually expressing by raising their hands and praising God for hearing the Word. And then we saw the third ingredient there in chapter 8 was genuine worship. They didn't get enough on the first church service. Some of the Spiritual leaders in the heads of the households came back and met with Ezra the next day and they had church again. And when that time of their Bible study, they discovered that they had not been genuinely worshiping God for almost a thousand years. God required the Israels, the Israelites during the Feast of Tabernacles to build this temporary housing like a shack. And during that time, those seven days, they were to move out of their homes and live in those shacks as they were, uh, they were remembering back to the time of their exodus when they were roaming the wilderness when God protected them and God provided for them. But you see what they've been doing is some of them had built shacks, but they never moved in. God required full obedience. He required, in order for them to genuinely worship Him and to celebrate the way they should, they were to move in. They hadn't done that in nearly a thousand years. They're broken. They're weeping. And the Bible says they all went out and got the materials and built their temporary dwellings. And we find there is the way that took place there in chapter 8. Now we come to our text here in chapter 9. As we'll see in just a few moments, revival continues. Chapter 9 has three more ingredients of revival. And this morning we're going to look at here how the people 
people repented of their sins before God and how God restored them. You know, repentance is vital for every person to know God intimately, to worship God exclusively, and serve God fruitfully, and to walk with Him consistently. Repentance should be a normal part of every believer's life. Let's read here these first three verses of Nehemiah, chapter 9, and then we'll have prayer together. Notice what God's Word says, beginning in verse 1. Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and dirt or earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of, their, the, uh, the, law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day. And another fourth part they confessed and worship the Lord their God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for having Nehemiah pen this account as a uh, as, as uh, your divine word, Lord. Help us this morning to glean truths from this text, Lord, realizing that repentance is vital to revival. Lord, help us this morning. If we have a need to repent of anything, Lord, may we be drawn by the power of the Holy Spirit to do so. Lord, we ask you specifically to draw some lost sinner to repentance today. In Jesus' name we pray. And amen. amen. We find here in our text this morning that if you and I are going to demonstrate biblical rep uh, repentance, there's four things that repentance involves. Notice, first of all here, that repentance involves sorrow for sin. Repentance involves sorrow for sin. Now, there's a difference here. Some people are just sorry they got caught. Can I get a witness? Amen. They're not genuinely, internally bothered and grieved that they had sinned. They're sorry they got caught. We call that jailhouse religion. Isn't it amazing at the jail how many people are suddenly repent? They're sorry, but they're not really sorry. They're just sorry they got caught. We find here these people are not sorry they got caught. They're genuinely bothered that they had sinned against holy God. Now we we'll know, know two things here in their display of repentance. Notice first of all here, the period of this assembly. The period of this assembly. Look at the first part of verse 1. Now in the 20 and 4th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled. Now this is important here. You, won't, you, won't, you, you think they're not having a revival. These people can't get enough of getting together and hearing the Word. It's the 24th day of the month. You say, what does that mean, preacher? Well, Nehemiah notes here that this, uh, that this assembly that we're about to look at happened on the 24th day. When we go back to chapter 8, originally they got together the first time on the second day of the month. Now this was an important month because during this month, we find several festivals that the Jews were to observe. There were three particular Jewish celebrations. On the first day of the month, they celebrated the Feast of the Trumpets. On the tenth day of the month, they celebrated the Day of Atonement. That's when the high priest went through this elaborate ritual of preparing himself. He had to bathe. He had to put on special clothes. He had to kill a sacrifice for his own sins and then take a sacrifice in the temple behind the veil and place blood on the mercy seat and get out as quick as he could, which would cover the sins of Israel for one year. And then on the 15th of the month through the 22nd of the month was the Feast of Tabernacles where they built these temporary dwellings. They lived in them for seven days, remembering how God had been faithful to them in their wilderness journeys. But notice here, Nehemiah says we're meeting here on the 24th. The Feast of Tabernacles was over on the 22nd, and if you look at the last verse of chapter 8, it said the day after they had another gathering the Solomon Assembly on the 23rd day. They're about to have church for three days in a row. That's definitely revival material in the Baptist church, isn't it? <laughs> They're gathering here on the 24th. So notice not only the period of this assembly, they can't get enough. Boy, I tell you, this is exciting. They can't get enough of God's Word. They keep coming back, and they keep coming back, and they keep coming back because they want to know more and more and more about God's Word. <laughs> No, 
notice not only the period of this assembly, but the purpose of this assembly. Why did they get together this time? Look at verse 1 of this entire now. Now the 20th and 4th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them. So we know they're not bad just because we don't believe in fasting. <laughs> <laughs> we ought to, it's biblical. Man, <laughs> parents are really to work on it. <laughs> you know, we usually associate fasting with something like a medical procedure. Something along that line, don't we? But here's the thing. Why are these people gathering here again? Well, they can't get enough of God's Word, but here's the primary reason. Remember back in chapter 8? After that six-hour sermon, the Bible says the people begin to weep and they begin to mourn. They had heard God's law preached to them for the first time on a regular basis in a long time, and the Bible says they begin to weep, and that word weep there means mourn. They were literally grieving and wailing like somebody had died. <coughs> they were disturbed by their sins. But if you go back and look, the leader says, hey, now's not the time to mourn your sins. We're about to go into the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a time of rejoicing. Hold off on your mourning. They've held off on their mourning, and now here they come to the time of mourning. You see, they're bothered by their sin. On this 24th day, they come together to express their brokenness and their sorrow for their sins. Now, the text says they come together to fast. Now, what is fasting, preacher? In a nutshell, fasting is doing away or temporarily not engaging in something so you can have a good spiritual focus. You see, you can fast several ways. You not only can you fast by not eating food, you can fast by not watching television. Think with me how much time you spend watching TV every day. What if you spent part of that time with the TV off in prayer? Ooh. What instead of being on Facebook, every chance you get, you took the time off from Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and all these other social media sites, and you spent that time in prayer? How much further along would you be as an individual spiritually? How much further along would our church be spiritually? How much further along would our nation be spiritually if we took time and denied ourselves some type of pleasure in order to spend that time in prayer? These people have gathered. They're not eating their food for the very purpose of they're going to weep and mourn over their sin. They're going to pray to God and ask God to make them right with Him and they're going to hear God's Word. Now notice here, here's the thing. When you and I fast, the sole purpose of that debate should be that we get closer to God and we can hear God better. I don't know about you, but sometimes I've got all this noise that just goes on in my mind constantly. Sometimes we just need to shut everything off, shut everything down, and get quiet and spend some time with God. Turn the phone off, the TV off, find you a quiet place, and just get along with God and listen to God. You see, these people were denying themselves physical food. You know why? Because they were hungry for God. They were hungry for God. But notice here, they weren't only just fasting. The Bible says they had on sackcloth. About the most modern example I know we could uh, come up with what I call a toe sack. You know what a toe sack is? Some of you do. You're burlap. Could you imagine wearing a Sunday dress today made out of burlap, ladies? <laughs> Gentlemen, could you imagine having some burlap underroots? <laughs> <laughs> These people have got on, they've got on a sackcloth here, which was in those times made out of goat and cow hair. Woo, that had to be uncomfortable. <laughs> Then here's, the symbol, here, here's the symbolism in the sackcloth. They are disturbed. To put sackcloth on was an outward expression of their mourning. They are mourning over their sin. And the text says they put dirt on top of their head. You get the picture? They're down low. They have humbled themselves before God. They've got this, this uh, sackcloth attire on. They've got dirt on their head. It's symbolic of their attitude inwardly. They are mourning over their sin. 
They're bothered by the fact that they have sinned against holy God. They stop what they're doing. They refuse to eat. They humble themselves before God and put on their sackcloth and put dirt on their head because they find themselves grieved by their sin. You see, when a person is genuinely sorry for their sin, there will be evidence of it. These people's actions, their attire, reflects their attitude. They are bothered by their sin. And if you and I are going to be genuinely repentant of our sin, there's going to be sorrow, evidence that we're bothered by our sin. Not the, oh yeah, I'm sorry, and move on. <coughs> so we find here that first of all, repentance involves sorrow for sin. Second, notice here that repentance involves separation from sinners. Repentance involves separation from sinners. Notice verse 2 again. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the sins or iniquities of their fathers. Now, who are these strangers? Depends on your translation. It says foreigners. You see, the nation of Israel was a Jewish nation. Anybody who wasn't a Jew was considered a foreigner or a stranger. You and I as Gentiles would have been considered foreigners and strangers in the Old Testament. You see, here's the thing. Those strangers, those foreigners, represent pagans. Who were the pagans? They didn't believe in the God of the Jews. They worshipped whatever. They were involved in whatever. They had all kinds of unbiblical religious activities. So here's the picture. The nation of Israel separates themselves from the pagans who are among them. They intentionally get themselves distanced from the pagan influence of those around them. And notice here, they, as they separate themselves, they're getting themselves, themselves away from this pagan influence, the Bible says they stood and confessed their own sins. Could you imagine the next few moments I ask everybody to stand up starting to believe that her confess her sins one by one publicly for everybody here today? She's fixing to crawl on the pew. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, these folks did blame. They're publicly confessing their own sins in front of each other. Crying out to God. They've got sackcloth on. They've got dirt on their head. They're mourning. They're grieving. They're so upset about their sin. Crying out to God, confessing their own sins in front of each other. But not only are they confessing their own sins, they're confessing the sins of their forefathers. You see, preacher, why in the world would they confess the sins of their forefathers? Because the sins of their forefathers had led them to where they are today. You know why America's in the shape it's in today? Because it's some of the sins of our forefathers. We got some people who didn't have backbones years ago, didn't make a stand, didn't take a stand, didn't preach the word, didn't stand for the word, and now you and I are reaping the results of not standing on God's word. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's, let's apply this to us. Our sin today will affect the future generation as well. Someday the future generation will need to confess our sins because we haven't done our job. It's easy to point the finger at somebody else, but it's a lot harder to set responsibility in it. We find them here. If in their repentance, they confess their sins. Now, I'm not going to get into that very deep because we're going to get into that later in chapter 9. But re repentance, a part of repentance is confessing your sins. And in order to repent of your sins, you must turn away from your sin and you're to turn to God. Listen, here this morning. You and I cannot come to God and continue to live for ourselves and our own pleasure and expect God to just say, oh, come on in. Here you come with me. you got dirty hands. you got a filthy mouth and a filthy mind. Just come on up here in my lap. Not the way God operates. You and I are going to approach God the way we want to. It's hard to approach God and repent of your sins if you're compromising with a lost world. You see, it was important for the children of Israel to separate themselves away from the pagan influence. 
You know, the Bible teaches that you and I are to come out and be separate from the pagans. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, 18, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will set you. Go back to verse 14. Most of you know this verse. Be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Here's where we fail in our interpretation. We said that applies to marriage, and it does. But it's a general application. That means you and I need to be careful and not get entangled with any unbeliever. Whether it's my boss, my business partner, my neighbor, or friend, I got to be very careful in my relationship with them. Here, let me illustrate this. There's a difference of being separate and being isolated. Let me give you a modern illustration of being isolated. The Amish. The Amish have isolated themselves, themselves from society. And they think they're doing the right thing, which biblically they're not. You say, what do you mean, preacher? How in the world are you and I supposed to win the laws if we don't have anything to do with them at all? <coughs> Amen? Amen? You can't win the laws if you have nothing to do with them. You and I must be careful in how we uh, interact with them. But that's the thing. Remember what Paul said? Paul is saying, yes, you and I would be separate. But Paul also said, you know what? I become all things to all men that I might win some. You can be separate and not be isolated. See the difference? We're to come out and be careful in our dealings with unbelievers, but we're to still reach out to them. You see, you and I as unbelievers, here, I'm excuse me, as believers, we are ambassadors of Jesus. Let me give you another illustration. The United States of America has ambassadors that go to foreign countries. That ambassador goes to a foreign country, they represent you and I in that country. But while they're there, they don't have to marry a woman from there or a man from there. They don't even have to practice the religion from that country. They don't even have to get real deep in the politics. All they're doing is representing you and I to that country. Same way with Jesus. Every one of us as believers are ambassadors of Jesus. We're representing Jesus. We are to represent Jesus to a lost and dying world. And we are to represent Him in a way that is right and positive. But we must be careful not to become entangled with the unbelievers' practices, actions, and desires. You and I must be careful. You see? You know why? Because you and I are foreigners and strangers in this land. You know, i got two homes. I got a home. They know where Chris, you drive Greenfield, Tennessee, and I got a home in heaven. Amen. You see, I got a dual citizenship. I'm a, I'm a citizen of, of, of the United States of America, but I'm also a citizen of heaven. But here's the thing that home on Chris, you drive is not my permanent home. Amen. It's just a place that I dwell, dwell at temporarily because I'm passing through, going to my eternal home in heaven someday. And while I'm here, I have to be an ambassador for Jesus. I have to represent him. I'm going to be careful in how I get entangled with the unbelieving pagans. We've got to be careful, folks. If you and I are going to repent of our sin, here's the thing. The drug addict has no business going back to his old drug friends and hanging out. The drunk, if he comes to Jesus, has no business going back to the bar and hanging out with the boys. If that man has problems with pornography, he has no business at a computer. You see, what I'm saying, we must be careful. We cannot entangle ourselves as believers in Jesus. Yes, we're to reach out, we're to love them and share the gospel, but we cannot become entangled with them. If you're going to repent of that sin of pornography, sir, if you're going to repent of that sin of pornography, ma'am, get on now, that women are just as likely to look at pornography as men. And if you're going to repent of that sin, the last thing you need to do is go back to where you've been doing it. Sir, if you're going to get off that bottle, quit hanging out with the boys. If you're going to get off the pipe and the crack and the pills, quit hanging out with that group. Find someone who can go and share the gospel and separate yourselves from sinners that you might be able to repent 
of your sins. Third, repentance. Not only involves sorrow for sin, repentance involves separation from sinners, but notice there also that repentance involves subjection to the Scriptures. Now notice here, the first part of verse 3, and they stood up in their place, here we go again, and read in the book of the law their God one-fourth part of the day. Now in chapter 8 we saw the people have been under the Word of God, they've been instructed in the ways of God, and we find them again coming back for more. You see, the text said they stood in their place. What's that mean there? In other words, they showed up, stood up, and they stayed until it was done. You see, here's the thing. They didn't leave early to go to the restaurant. They didn't run back and forth to the outhouse. They heard God's Word and gave it their full attention. And notice here that the Bible says they read it for one-fourth of the day. For three hours, they read the Word of God. Some of you are going to do good during this 35 minute sermon. You see why I say these people have revival? They had a hunger for the Word of God. Three solid hours they listened to God's Word being read. You know, the average carnal Baptist couldn't handle that. As I said, we do, most Baptists do good to endure a one hour worship service, including music announcements and everything else. Now, that's the Word of God. You see, here's the thing. Not everybody loves the Bible. Not everybody believes the Bible. Hear me this morning. You don't know why Satan is having his way in so many churches? Because so many churches have gone away from making the Word of God their priority. Oh yes, they're good at entertaining. Their music is great. They've got a good coffee bar. They've got all these other things. And they can entertain you. And they've got activities. But they place a bare minimum on the Word of God. The first priority for me when I look for a church someday is not going to be what's going on everywhere else. It's going to be what happens right here. That man going to preach the Bible. He better preach the Word of God as the inherent, infallible, inspired Word. He better not back up. He better not check up. He better not let up. He better get in the, in the pulpit, open up that book, and preach, Thus saith the Lord. And I found through the years how shallow most Christians are. They pick a church based on the music and the activities and all these other things, and they don't give a hoot about the Word of God being preached. Friend, if that's your mentality, that reveals where you are in your spiritual maturity. You're still a baby on the bottom that needs to be weaned. You should have a hunger and a desire to hear God's Word. You see, here's the thing. You and I, if we're going to repent of our sins, we've got to put ourselves, we've got to subject ourselves to the Scripture. Because here's the thing. I, you know what I found out? The more I study, and listen, I've studied the Bible thousands and thousands and thousands of hours now. And you know what I find? I don't find, my, I don't find James Hazelwood looking a bit better than I did when I started. You know what I find? The deeper I go, the longer I walk with Jesus, I find out how wretched I am. I find out this how, how much I need repentance. If you're sitting there smugly today thinking you don't need repentance, you're the prime candidate to need to repent. Because I'm going to tell you, when you get in the Word of God and the Spirit of God speaks to you, it'll break you down. It'll convict you. It'll put you on your knees. It'll make you cry out to Jesus. It'll make you thank Him for His mercy and His grace. And you'll be like, Paul, woe is me. And, and, and as Isaiah cried out, woe is me. As the Apostle Paul cried out, oh, wretched man. You know what the Word of God is? It's a mirror. And that mirror shows you and I just how bad we really are. And when these people spent more and more and more time in God's Word, they had to confess their sins because they saw just how wicked and vile they really were. When the Word of God is absent in your life or in a church, wickedness will abound and there'll be no hopeless in anybody's life. You see, here's the thing. These people subjected themselves to the Scripture. They allowed God's Word to have authority over them. 
And when the Word of God had spoken to them, they obeyed it and they repented of their sins. You see, notice here, these people, they approach God humbly. Don't miss this example here this morning, folks. They approach God humbly. They put on the sackcloth. They had dirt on their heads. They denied themselves physical food. They devoted their attention to spiritual matters. They separated themselves from the pagan people and their pagan influences. They placed themselves under the authority of God's Word. And hear me this morning. If the church today would follow that example, we would see revival all across the land. We find it here happening with these people. We've seen that repentance involves sorrow. For sin. Repentance involves separation from sinners. We've got to be careful not to get entangled with pagan people and their influences. We find that repentance involves subjection to the scriptures. The more you and I spend time in God's Word, we will see the sin in our lives and we will be forced to either confess it or cover it up. But finally, I want you to notice here that repentance involves sincerity with the Savior. Repentance involves sincerity with the Savior. Look at verse 3 in its entirety. And they stood up in their place and read the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day and another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. Look, folks. They spent three hours listening to the Word of God and they spent the next three hours confessing their sins and worshiping God. They had a six-hour total worship service. Woo! At least it wasn't all preaching right. That's the last time we preached for six hours. Here's what I want you to see. They were sincere in their confession of sins. We'll see tonight as we begin this. Tonight we get in here. This is the long chapter nine has the longest prayer in the Bible right here. Again, verse six. The longest prayer in the Bible starts at verse six. As we get in this long prayer. We see that these people have repented of their sins and are coming clean before God. Here's what I want you to notice. There's a good balance here between the Word and confession and worship. You see, here's, don't miss this. Don't get this out of order. Don't get you buggy before you horse. Sometimes we want to jump into prayer without spending any time in the Word. But you notice what happened here first? They got into work. Why? Because they heard from God first. And then they were able to speak to Him. You see, to you and I hear from Him what are we supposed to say to Him? Most Christians have a one-way communication with God. They do all the talking and they expect Him to do all the listening. Won't you try that in your marriage? See how long you stay married. <laughs> it's a two-way communication. Most Christians do all their talking to God. Here's my wish list. Here's my problems. Here's my wants. And then they cut it off. They're not listening for God. Listen, you want to hear God speak? Open your Bible and begin to read and He's speaking to you. You know why? Because this is God's Word. So these people, they heard from God first and through His Word and then they're speaking to Him. They're confessing their sins and repenting. That word confessed here in the Old Testament Hebrew has a unique meaning. It means to throw or turn loose. Here's a picture of confession. You've got this sin. you got it under the cloak here. Your wife don't know about it. Preacher don't know about it. Your kids don't know about it. Your boss don't know about it. But God knows about it. And if you're going to confess your sin, you've got to turn it loose. You've got to expose it. You've got to let go of the control you have trying to cover your sin and hide it from God. And these people just simply turn loose of control. They quit trying to hide their sin. They quit trying to cover up. They turn it loose and let God have it. You see, when you and I confess our sins, we're no longer trying to conceal our sins. The Bible in the, in the New Testament, the word confess just simply means to agree with. In other words, when you confess your sin, you're saying, God, I believe what you say. This is wrong. This word's used in 1 John 1 9, where John says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful.
faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we confess, when we throw it, we open up, we turn loose of control, we quit concealing, we quit hiding, we're turning our sins over to God. As John said, when we confess those sins, we can be forgiven those sins. You see, if you and I are going to be repentant of our sins, we need to be sincere with the Lord. We've got to be open. We've got to be honest. We can't hide our sins. And have you ever thought about this? Why do we try to hide something God already knows about? We're really messed up, aren't we? We think we're smooth enough that we can keep something from God? He already knows it. Own up to it. Did your mom ever come to you with the question she already knew the answer to? And she was going to give you the opportunity to fess up and it, it, it being ignorant. You should have picked up. Oh, she already knows. What do we do with human nature? Do we come up with some long fabricated something? And then she said, Boy, I already know. You better tell me the truth. God already knows, folks. Why? So why are you and I trying to cover up our sins? Why do we think we're sly enough to fool God about our sins? I want you to notice something here. Until you and I confess our sins and get clean and right with God, He's not going to accept our worship. <clears throat> you and I can't... Could you imagine tomorrow morning you're having surgery? And right before the anesthesiologist says, count to ten, the surgeon comes rushing in. He's got his, his khaki shorts on, his polo shirt. He just come out of the garden. He's got sweat from head to toe and I'll dry stitch on him. He's got dirt. He's got mud. His hands are filthy. And he says, hand me the scalpel. You'd be like, wait just a second. You're filthy. Don't you come in this sterile operating room filthy. You and I try to come into the throne room of God just as filthy. Our hands are filthy. We've done dirty deeds this week. Our hearts are wretched. We've had nasty attitudes. We've said awful words. We've had terrible thoughts. And we come rushing up to holy God in His sterile throne room of holiness and we think we've got the right to be there. And just as that surgeon, you were telling him to get out of that sterile operating room, you and I have no business coming to God filthy with sin, thinking that He should accept us. You see, that's why repentance is important, folks. If you and I are going to have a close relationship with God, we must repent of our sins. You know, all together they had a six-hour worship service. I say that's very obvious that revival's happening, wouldn't you? They're standing there listening to the Word. They're spending three hours confessing their sins and worshiping God. But you want to know one of the real indicators in the modern church as to why we need revival? There's a lack of interest in spiritual things. Isn't it amazing that we do good to endure a one-hour church service with singing and announcements and a little preaching? We go to a ball game and last three or four hours. Never complain. Go see Albert Pujols return to Bush State <laughs> and never complain. Not counting the drive to St. Louis and back. That football game goes into overtime and we're out in the weather. It ain't that big a deal. Boy, that preacher needs to shut up by 12. I'm going to get to the restaurant. <laughs> see the disinterest? The average pew setting back just today is disinterested in spiritual things. They have no desire for spiritual matters. You see, that's the problem we have is there's not a desire for spiritual matters. These people have a desire for spiritual matters. How much interest do you have in spiritual matters today? Let me ask you this morning. Outside of the reading of the Word of God, you just heard right here a few minutes ago throughout this sermon, how much time do you spend in God's Word every week? On a daily basis, how much time do you spend on your own in God's Word? How much time do you spend confessing your sins on a daily basis? Remember last fall I gave you all that paperwork 
If some of you have been using that in your prayer time, the bewildered look tells me you're not. <laughs> oh, what paper? Huh? What? Uh, that's why I give those things to you. Remember, we was getting ready for revival last year. Sins of thought, sins of attitude, sins of commission, omission, self reliance self-reliance, relationships. All those areas we're to look at our lives and say, God, am I missing your mark in those areas of my life? Those are ways we can examine our lives and confess our sins. Outside of church service, how much time do you spend worshiping God every week? Listen, you know what I love about this new truck I got? <laughs> One of many things. It's got Bluetooth in it. <laughs> now, when I'm going down the road and me and the Holy Ghost have a spell, folks don't know if I'm on the phone or not. <laughs> uh, used to, they probably said, hey, officer, I want to turn in his license plate. Now, this fellow needs to be committed. He looked like he was having some kind of seizure going down the road. <laughs> well, I get happy in Jesus now. They don't know I'm on the phone or not. <laughs> you, worship, you worship the Lord going down the road. Yeah, right. Worship Him in the shower. Praise God. <laughs> worship Him. This ain't the only time you're to worship. We're going to be worshiping God outside of church. i got to move on. So much to say, but i got to wrap this up. I ask you this morning. Do you practice genuine repentance in your own life? Do you have a deep sorrow for sin when you fall short and miss the mark and sin against God? Do you seek to separate yourself from the influence and actions of unbelieving people and unbelieving places? Or maybe you've allowed them to influence you. How much time do you spend yourself putting yourself under the authority of the Scriptures? Maybe you're here today and there's some sin you need to confess and say, you know, the, the Holy Spirit has spoken to me specifically this morning and I've got this I need to confess. I invite you to come do that this morning. But here, turn loose. Quit concealing. He already knows on up to it. Ms. Donna, Brother Chris, we'll come. We're going to have a song of invitation. Maybe you're here this morning and you're lost. You don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You too need to repent. You need to turn away from sin and self. And you need to embrace Jesus and come to Jesus. And I invite you, if the Lord is speaking to you this morning, if He is dealing with your heart about coming to faith in Christ, I invite you to come. I'll be down front if you have a need. The altar is open here as we stand and sing. What about Brother Chris? Number 99 in the river. Number 99 in the river. <laughs>